and we're live everyone. Please begin. Bulavandaka everyone, greetings from uh, Suba uh, to all the hubs around the Pacific. Malolele, uh, Fafitai, and good morning uh, to all those in the room uh, and joining us uh, this morning. Uh, my name is uh, Alifereti Tawake uh, with the locally managed marine area network, uh, and we'll be helping uh, moderate the session with uh, Mr. Uh, Ron Vade. Uh, the session is, uh, is on traditional knowledge or traditional wisdom uh, and practices essential to resilience. Uh, as we all uh, heard from yesterday, it is widely acknowledged that the journey towards uh, resilience starts at home. And uh, that starting point at home, uh, uh, to uh, traditional, traditional of it. Uh, we, hear, we hear that very clearly from uh, the last two days uh, from the plenary and the Honorable uh, Prime Minister of, uh, of Tuvalu. Uh, so we're very familiar with why traditional wisdom and practices are essential. Uh, and for this session, we have a very exciting lineup of speakers. Uh, we are going to look at more on, on how uh, with uh, some case studies. Eh? Uh, so that is uh, traditional wisdom. Uh, you know, they are, they are part of our, our Pacific cultural heritage. Uh, and it is necessary for our survival, uh, rejuvenation, and transformation to uh, a future that is uh, resilient. Eh? Uh, so, and the accumulation of knowledge uh, through learning and experiences over decades, uh, most scholars are calling it, uh, it can only become wisdom when it is beneficial to uh, people and society. And that is what we call in Fijian, in, or in Tauke languages, yellow matua. Uh, when knowledge becomes beneficial to people and society. Uh, so, uh, and that yellow matua or wisdom also is essential for decision-making uh, and what brings mana, uh, whether it's blessing from above or for all the, the provisions from the creations uh, from nature and what we are, uh, think that are, resili uh, are important for our resilience. So today we are, we are going to hear the, the examples of how uh, traditional wisdom and practices are being applied uh, in to, uh, towards uh, resilience, building resilience. Eh? And we have uh, uh, some also some challenging uh, issues that the Pacific are trying to address uh, and how uh, the knowledge and the practices are being used to uh, inform decision makers and also um, uh, put a light uh, to some of these difficult issues, one being um, uh, of our uh, resilient food systems or, or, and gender. Uh, the other one is uh, uh, restoring uh, our food systems, uh, fisheries. Uh, and the most recent one is around um, uh, COVID-19 uh, and also uh, climate change, how do we tell or inform uh, our people about climate change and weather patterns. So without further ado, let me introduce you to the first uh, speaker, uh, Mr. Ron Vave, and he's also going to help moderate the session for us. Um, he is uh, familiar with the Pacific. He's a PhD student at the uh, University of uh, Hawaii. Uh, he's done a lot of work, uh, research in the Pacific. And, uh, and uh, for, he, for him, he's going to share with us uh, some of the, the practices uh, around protected area and around funeral. 
Um, Ron Vibeb, uh, take it away. Hello, Vanaka, everyone. Um, my talk today is going to be on the filmary affected area of practice in Fiji, and it is a small component of my PhD research in marine biology at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. In some parts of Fiji, indigenous Fijian communities, the area of reef or river, following the burial of a loved one, starting from the day of burial. The area is protected for about 100 days, after which it is harvested, and the catch is used in a memorial feast that brings to an end the official mourning period. So what I wanted to know from this research was, if these funerary protected areas are practiced all across Fiji, and if so, to what extent are they still being practiced, and what we could learn from it. The colored regions on this map are Fiji's 14 provinces. Uh, within each of the provinces are district boundaries, uh, which total 189 in Fiji. To know the extent of FDA practice in Fiji, I tried to gather information uh, from each of the 189 districts with regards to funeral areas. To ensure the research findings are useful to communities, I wanted to visualize the extent to which funeral areas are practiced. Looking at VT level in particular, and focusing on the district of Suvo, just as an example, where the capital city of Suvo is located, I would ask the villagers in the district of Suvo as to what extent they, they protect an area of Rifa River following the burial of a loved one. And I would uh, color code their responses using these traffic light indicators, which people are familiar with. If the people of the district of Suvo say they establish funerary protected areas and they still do, then I'd color it green. Uh, if they don't, then I'd color it red and so forth. So for this research, I was able to interview people from 175 districts across Fiji. The results show that 73 districts um, still actively establish funerary protected areas around the country. Of interest is these 34 districts, 19% uh, of communities that were surveyed that have ceased the funerary protected area implementation. The lessons and challenges, one, funerary protected areas are part of our cultural practice. Its implementation strengthens relationships and resource management rights. Uh, that the fish caught is used ceremonially, but also as food. And the use of food, uh, the, the use of catch as seafood of food offsets the need to purchase food, which is good for rural communities. Third, funerary protected areas are place-based, so it's only done in clan waters of the deceased, and only for those buried in the village. So any out-migration negates implementation. Funerary protected areas are largely excluded from management uh, plans that are done. And finally, because Western knowledge systems uh, is what people from conservation uh, you know, learn from, uh, protected areas are often skimmed over and excluded. I only had three minutes, so thank you for your time. for this the next speaker so that I'm going to introduce the next speaker. Um, I believe the next up is Terry Jackson. So Terry is the coordinator for the Indo-Pacific Locally Managed Marine Area Network and she's going to be talking about the impacts of COVID-19 on Pacific Island fishing communities highlighting principles for resilience. We will hand this time over to you. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Terry Tuxen. Um, uh, like Ron said, I work for the Locally Managed Marine Area Network International, and I'm based in Suva, Fiji. The LMMA network um, supports and promotes uh, community empowerment and resilience um, at the regional and international scale. In April of last year, uh, funded by the Pacific European Union Marine Partnership Program, we started investigating the possible impacts that the COVID-19 pandemic might have had on coastal and island communities in the Pacific region. The Rapid Response Survey um, was developed, originally developed in the, by the World Fish Center in the Solomon Islands. It was subsequently adapted by the LMA Network and its partners. And the survey of, or version of it was conducted in seven countries between May and October of 2020. So as you can see on the map here, the countries that uh, conducted, that participated in the survey, um, the number of surveys conducted um, in each country, and very importantly, the organizations that 
conducted the surveys um, on the ground in their respective countries. Um, all communities had, had some sort of existing relationship with these organizations. So what did we find out? Um, so most communities were food secure in the early stages of the pandemic. Um, we found that increased agricultural production did occur in all, across all countries. And factors like communal living, um, steady food production systems, uh, solid governance structures, and traditional practices, uh, for example, um, food sharing in, uh, amongst community members in all countries, um, Sola Solovati in Fiji, taro patching and um, uh, food preservation techniques in Micronesia, as well as bartering in Papua New Guinea, all these things um, contribute to resilience in Pacific communities. So most of these communities, they will have home gardens. They'll also have collective community gardens. Um, they make good use of their marine resources. Um, they possess some degree of recognition of um, traditional ownership of fishing grounds, or they recognize the rights of access by traditional resource users to these fishing grounds. So um, we also found out that fishing pressure basically stayed um, the same across um, the countries. Um, so we've also found that government migration occurred in countries like Solomon Island. Government encouraged migration occurred in Solomon Islands and Tuvalu. So this is where the government encouraged people to move out of the capital cities and either back to their home villages or they encouraged them to move to outer islands. Um, additionally, in, in countries like Fiji, when people lost employment, they also um, tended to move back to their villages. Um, other government restrictions included uh, um, nationwide curfews, um, disrupted inter-island shipping services uh, caused uh, food shortages in village canteens, as well as reduced fuel availability. Um, social gathering restrictions also affected village meetings. So keep in mind during the survey, um, uh, Fiji and Papua New Guinea were the only two countries with uh, um, active COVID cases. Okay, so we found that there was increased hardship um, in groups like this small scale commercial fishers of Indo-Fijian descent because there was less access to land and thus less opportunity for um, home gardens or collective community gardens. In uh, certain areas of Vanuatu, Solomon Islands, Tuvalu, and um, also with Indo-Fijian small scale commercial fishers, um, reliance on single source incomes was a, was a factor. And in remote areas of Vanuatu and Solomon Islands, market access to main islands, as well as provision of relief items and store items were um, affected by the disrupted inter-island shipping services. So there's relatively low human hardship found where there's adequate access to land, and that means the opportunity for increased agricultural activities. So other factors like social capital, um, rights of access to resources, um, as well as access to information, access to communications, and access to government services in less remote areas also were a contribution. So many of these countries that were surveyed, they were also impacted by cyclones. So in January, tropical cyclone Tino um, hit Tuvalu as well as areas of Tonga. Then in um, early April or in April, severe tropical cyclone Harold um, really impacted Fiji, Solomon Islands, Vanuatu and Tonga. So recovery efforts from cyclones can take months, sometimes years to implement. Um, um, Papua New Guinea and Vanuatu were also affected by drought. As, and so this resulted in poor harvests. So these negative occurrences, they only added to um, COVID government restrictions. So for example, where there was an influx of people back to the villages or there was disrupted shipping services, um, this placed, the, uh, placed um, increased pressure on existing food resources. So the, um, the good thing was, is that we found in most communities, they did try to keep up with or maintain their management, uh, resource management initiatives. So for example, maintaining size restrictions, gear restrictions, um, as well as importantly, a lot of the village elders were um, raising, involved in raising awareness of the, you know, reminding the villages about, uh, about maintaining resource, uh, ma resource management initiatives. I have to make a note here that lifting tambu was not one of the main responses undertaken by communities. Um, at the time of the surveys. In fact, most communities with tambu areas, they opted to preserve them, which is a good sign. Um, most importantly, we found that uh, strengthening local food practices is essential to um, um, supporting food security in rural Pacific communities. So what can we do? Um, 
natural resource management, it needs to be reinforced and valued. Because of widespread loss of employment, as well as ongoing government restrictions, we find that there's an increased self-reliance at a national scale for an uncertain period of time into the future. Unlike short-term responses um, with uh, natural disasters, which might include um, relaxing of fishing regulations to, to temporarily relieve food shortages, um, this sort of reduction in management, it doesn't make sense for such an unpredictable or a long-term crisis like this. Um, in the long term, it's important to develop ways to address vulnerability factors. So we need to um, relieve pressure on near shore and coastal marine resources. Um, we need to fish and ensure that fisher and community rights are protected. And we also need to develop localized solutions for sustainable development. So whilst negatively impacted, um, many but not all Pacific communities emerge resilient. Um, and it's important to understand how and where this happened so we can inform the relevant authorities as well as um, supporting uh, other less resilient communities. Benaka, everyone, thank you so much. Thank you, Terry. Um, the, should, we just quickly touched on disruptions brought about by COVID, more people moving back to the villages, people getting into gardening and so forth. And so with that, we'll segue into the next presentation, which is by Maxim Anjiga. Maxine Anjiga is from Papua New Guinea. She is the coordinator for the Papua New Guinea uh, Center for Locally Managed Marine Areas. And she will be pre presenting on about traditional governance and resource management. Maxine, over to you. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. So um, in Papua New Guinea, we've been doing this uh, uh, marine management of uh, resources with our communities for about uh, more than 15 years. After these years, we have learned that we can't get the women to participate when we go into the community and start talking about gender equality, equal participation, and um, women have to be able to access services and that they have to be able to um, participate in decision making. And so we decided to do away with the words um, gender. If we can move to the next slide, please. Yes, yeah, so we went to this, uh, on the map, you can see central province of Papua New Guinea that is very close to Port Mosby. The area that we are working in is uh, predominantly governed by the chiefs and women have their place. Women uh, for thousands of years have not been allowed to take decision-making places, even though they can influence decision-making, but they have not been allowed to rise up. And, and we thought that's because when we come and start talking about gender equality, our men felt that we're trying to make the women um, go higher than the men, or everything is about empowering women and this empowering the systems. Um, next slide. Okay, so because of time, I will not go through all those that I have put, but we try to understand that this is gender, this is gender equality, this is gender equity, but it wasn't working in Papua New Guinea. Our communities, our men didn't allow our women to participate in decision making when we went in with these words, these foreign words that didn't make sense to us for a long, long time. And it took us like 15 years, 15 to 20 years to understand that. Next slide. Next one. Okay, so there you can see the process that we are taking. We are doing a community engagement. Then we do baseline studies. Then we do um, capacity building and then we're doing governance and sustainability. Next slide. So we went to one of the communities and we documented the, a success story that was coming out from just one village in Papua New Guinea. And we saw that the women organized themselves 
And then they mobilized and they got the wives of the chiefs to talk to the chiefs without talking about gender. And then the chiefs allowed the women leader to participate in the decision making. So we documented that as you can see on the screen. Next screen, next slide. And so we went to three other communities and we tried to understand if this kind of system exists in, other, in all other places. And so we went to Manus province in the north, which is close to Palau. And then we went to Kairuku central province that I was showing you on the map. And we tried to replicate this, adapt it and replicate it. Next slide. So for thousands of women, uh, for thousands of years, women have not been allowed onto the platform. When we go to run training, we run training on the ground. But after we did away with the words gender and we asked permission from the chiefs to allow the women to participate, they had allowed us onto the platform. And the chiefs sat and they listened to the women discuss. Next slide. So without the word uh, use of the word gender and gender equality and gender participation, the chiefs allow the women to go into the mangroves and do studies with the professor at the University of Papua New Guinea to measure carbon, to study the health of the uh, mangrove environment. And that was never done before. Next slide. Now you can see that women are now allowed to sit on the platforms where only men sit and plan for their um, resource management. And they actually took the leadership while the men happily went and babysat for the first time in thousands of years. Next slide. With the men's support, you can see that we recorded uh, uh, information from one village that they were selling, they normally sold crabs, but after women took the leadership and men supported them, in many ways, you can see their income doubled and tripled. And that's because we got the support from the chiefs without talking about gender equality and gender participation. Next slide. So this slide is showing the support. This slide is showing women leadership. This slide is showing that women are still continuing to do this work. And even after um, the project ended, that was a year ago, women are still taking the lead and men are supporting them. So we believe that traditional systems can help us to be resilient. Sometimes foreign words come and then they come as blockages and we can't uh, do the work that we want to do effectively. Thank you. Nakawakalevu uh, Maxine for that wonderful presentation. It is so good to uh, hear about women uh, being empowered. And yet despite all the work that has been done so far, uh, that there's some um, misconstruing of information by the men who are interpreting it as women being used to overpower uh, men in particular. Uh, for the next speaker, we are going, it, the next speaker is Dr. Rosiana Lange. She is the deputy head of school uh, at USP for the learning and training. Uh, what we're going to do next is we're going to show you a video uh, that has interviews of Tuvalu elders on climate change and weather indicators. This was done during uh, Dr. Ross's work uh, in Tuvalu. And so we'll play this video next, and then we'll get straight into the Q&A, where if you have any questions, we'll then allow Dr. Rossi to field questions then. So Katie, if you could uh, play the video. Traditional ecological knowledge is uh, holistic. Uh, it includes uh, the indigenous people's traditional values of respect 
and their relationship with their whenua or their environment. Traditional uh, ecological knowledge is um, significant for people's survival. Uh, it is um, passed on generationally through observation, orally, and through practice in the forms of songs, dances, artwork, poetry, rituals, and ceremonies. Intertwined in this notion is the existence of the spirit that gives indigenous people wisdom to effectively use the traditional knowledge for a sustainable livelihood to ensure their survival. There was a research conducted here in uh, Tuvalu uh, in 2019. It was funded by the Foundation Youth Development in partnership with Jeff SGP and the University of the South Pacific Tuvalu campus. In this research it was found that Tuvaluans use their traditional indicators to forecast approaching weather at the same time use this knowledge to prepare for the approaching weather. When members of the community see these indicators, they inform other members of the community and start preparing for the forecasted uh, weather pattern. In Tuvalu, there are eight island communities. They are Nanumea, Nanumanga, Niutao, Nui, Vaitupu, Nukfetao, Funafuti and uh, Nukulailai. Of these eight island communities, eight elders were identified to share with us their knowledge of these traditional indicators that they used over the years to forecast the different weather patterns that were approaching. According to the research, the elders highlighted that this traditional knowledge has helped save their lives in the past. The behavior of birds and insects, silence and humidity in the atmosphere, color and shape of the cloud, discovery of fresh looking gravel, jellyfish, sea foam, and the number of breadfruit in a brunch are indicators for strong winds or cyclone. Oh, my God. 
indicators for rain can be observed in the behavior of birds and insects, animals, as well as the color and the formation of the clouds. Some of the um, indicators of a drought is the formation of the ground, the uh, colors of the leaves, and the types of um, fish that are caught. <laughs> So uh, some of the indicators for an approaching tidal wave would be the change in color and the sound given off by the reef and the sea. Fine weather conditions can be forecasted through the observation um, on the color of the sky as well as the absence of uh, clouds. <laughs> Traditional ecological knowledge in Tuvalu, according to the elders, has been passed down generationally through observation, practice, and orally, through songs and dances. To ensure the continuity of this traditional ecological knowledge, it is shared in community meetings, in workshops, and also in the school curriculum. According to the elders, Traditional ecological knowledge is essential for the survival and continuity of the Finua. Therefore, its practice in Tuvalu is commendable. Seeing the effectiveness of traditional ecological knowledge, um, traditional weather indicators, um, it is advisable to tailor it with um, 
Western science of forecasting uh, weather patterns so that we may have a more accurate and uh, relevant way of um, forecasting weather and enable our people to be better prepared for the changing weather patterns that we are experiencing today. As they are relevant and essential for our survival, it is important that we embrace this knowledge and share it with the younger generation to better prepare themselves for the changing weather patterns. This can be done through documentation in the different forms of media and practices. So that brings us to the end of uh, all speaking sessions. I'd like to thank you for your time and listening. Uh, and now we would like to move into the Q&A session. We have been trying to get the questions across from the Pacific Resilience Management Platform, but uh, so far, I think there's one question that's here for Rossi. Uh, so Rossi, the question that we have for you is, you consider traditional knowledge in housing construction um, in the video intervention study that you did? No, we didn't uh, capture it in the, in the video, but uh, yes, uh, this I mean, in, uh, in the children's big book, actually uh, there's something after this video, there are 33 big books, uh, story books for children, that documents the practices and the traditional knowledge and wisdom of, uh, of uh, Tuvaluans. So um, hopefully by October, we'll have uh, these big books launched. We have another question for you again. Uh, seems like the video has been a hit, so you're getting most of the questions. The next question is, are these changes observed, weather patterns, um, and it's a tra traditional knowledge due to climate change. For example, the Fijian calendar. Are there any observed I, changes? Uh, yes. Um, uh, actually, uh, the the Tuvalu video is uh, um, a, a product or uh, of uh, of my research study in uh, Ovalau, where we uh, also uh, documented in in my thesis. Uh, the um, uh, traditional uh, Fijian uh, weather forecasting uh, knowledge. And um, there is uh, um, an indigenous Fijian um, calendar and uh, it is observed that uh, uh, the Western calendar um, uh, puts our, um, our months, uh, well, names the months, whereas for the elders, they, they don't have, um, the, a similar name as we have, but the months are named according to the season. So the change in the environment and the season dictates um, uh, what they do. Uh, so, um, so yes, we have um, uh, an indigenous Fijian uh, calendar. And uh, despite the fact that um, uh, climate is changing, um, the indicators are still available because the beauty of it is that there is not only one indicator, there are more than one indicator. So if one has become extinct or are not available, there is uh, something else. But the, the danger is in the, in the fact that uh, we are not documenting and we are not digitizing, we are not um, including this in the curriculum so that our children can learn about them. We have a few other questions for you, but I think for now, uh, I believe Tawake has a question for Maxine of PNG. So maybe Tawake will pass it over to you. Maxine, uh, you're next in responding.
Yes, um, uh, hello. Um, um, I think we've, we've heard very you know, exciting um, um, indicators of how it's applied in Fiji and also in, uh, in Tuvalu. Uh, Maxine, would you be able to also share if, they, if you have uh, similar uh, experiences or traditional uh, knowledge of telling or uh, whether, especially when, if, if it involves uh, women? Maxine, you may be uh, muted. Okay, hello. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so in, um, yes, in Papua New Guinea, we have in the area that uh, we have been working with women. Um, women are the ones that collect and gather food resources from the mangrove areas. Um, there are seasons in which uh, they collect and they harvest. There are seasons which, in which they, they don't and there are rules that they apply. But today we're having a lot of issues because we are having longer droughts. We are having more floods and everything is going into chaos. So when we have um, months and months of uh, drought, and then we have, when we have rain, rainy season, the whole place is flooded. And so we can't follow those seasons anymore. So it's a really big challenge that uh, we're having here in the area that we were, uh, that I was uh, sharing with you about. Dr. Maxine, uh, Rosiana, maybe you can um, put on what Maxine has just shared. Given that the weather is changing, how um, how is traditional knowledge evolving in response to the changes that we see? Uh, Ron, as I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, there is not only one indicator. Eh? So despite the fact that uh, the, the climate is changing, the elders are, are watching the environment and are seeing the changes because this is what shows uh, uh, the, the indication uh, of uh, an approaching weather or forecast the weather type or the season that's coming. So um, for them, uh, uh, maybe the month is different, but the, but the indicators for the seasons uh, uh, is still there. So uh, they, they are able to to prepare before something like that happens. And I, I must say recently, there was a drought in Tuvalu, but this was forecasted because the elders were able to see the cracks in the, in the, in the ground and the change in color of the, the leaves. Uh, so they prepared uh, before the drought and uh, recently there was rain, so, so that's good news. So I think um, the, the issue is that we, don't know the indicators at the same time we are not very observant uh, with what's happening uh, with our environment eh? and um, uh, there's a question in relation to uh, uh, to um, to um, having a, a scientific proof of this um, uh, I must say that uh, five years ago when I started uh, when I was working on this in Fiji the Fiji met uh, uh, was looking into this, and uh, currently in Tuvalu, the Fiji Met, uh, sorry, the Tuvalu Meteorological Office as well, are working together with um, research groups and organizations that um, that are responsible for documenting uh, this there. And and I must congratulate Tuvalu for continuing the work. And another question for you. Uh, we know that in the Pacific, uh, everyone has their traditional knowledge. You know, Tuvalu has their own, Fiji has their own. Some of it are similar. And the fact that you've documented traditional knowledge on weather indicators from Tuvalu, I think the question that follows is, 
is that knowledge transferable and usable in other communities across the Pacific? Avinaka, um, um, yes, there are some knowledge that are similar, like for example, the, um, the, uh, the fruiting of uh, breadfruit, uh, more than three in a branch, uh, indicates uh, a cyclone. In Fiji, that is, uh, uh, that is the same. And uh, the other interesting thing I found out about breadfruit is uh, the number of uh, breadfruit uh, in a branch indicates the, the intensity or the, um, uh, the category of the cyclone. So yes, it is, um, it is uh, transferable, uh, but um, as, as we all know that, um, that traditional knowledge is context-based um, and uh, it, it'll vary uh, depending on the, on the context but otherwise, uh, generally, uh, there are certain things that are similar. And there was a question on uh, food preservation. Yes, there's also um, a book on food preservation in Tuvalu. Their main uh, staple food uh, is uh, uh, pulaka or swam taro uh, and coconut and fish. These are part of their diet and yes, they have uh, food preservation um, uh, strategies uh, to preserve this food uh, for, for later use. Given that uh, we're supposed to finish at 4.45, had our time extended because of some slight changes that happened to our program. Uh, so we'd like to thank the viewers who are on here uh, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to put it into the chat so we can ask our speakers. We have our time uh, has been extended for another eight more minutes. Any questions for the speakers, feel, please feel free to uh, ask them. We have Maxine Anjiga from Papua New Guinea. She spoke on women and fisheries um, and the locally managed marine area work that they're doing. Same thing with Terry uh, in relation to COVID and Dr. Rosiana with regards to traditional knowledge on climate change indicators from Tuvalu. I don't see any questions coming through the chat. So basically at this point, I would like to ask each of the speakers to uh, just go through one by one and say, what are your key messages that you'd like to leave with uh, viewers today from each of your presentations. So we'll start just in the, we'll go in the order that we did our talking sessions on. Uh, so for me, who was the first speaker, my talk was on funeral protected areas. Basically, um, they're unknown, they're under-researched, and because of that, they're not documented. Because the traditional knowledge on funeral protected areas are not documented, they do not make it into the Western curriculum. And as such, they're not taught to our conservation practitioners who go out into communities. So that is one of the challenges uh, from me. And that's something that needs to change. Then our next speaker was Terry Tuxen. So Terry, uh, any words or lessons from your presentation that you'd like to leave with our viewers? Um, just quickly to add that um, community resilience, uh, the factors that determine uh, a resilient community should not be underestimated and um, in fact should be uh, emphasized uh, the importance of it and maintained, um, especially to do with the resource management initiatives. Um, thank you very much for having me. Uh, Maxine. Yes, hello. I would like to say that uh, the traditional system that existed for thousands of years in the Pacific uh, is very important if we're going to progress. Yes, we need science, but more and more we are stepping back to understand our traditional systems. And earlier I was responding to the um, how we are looking at the weather and, um, and how we can move forward. And we have gone back to using our traditional butter system where the coastal people exchange um, fish with vegetables from the inland. And, and 
and we can survive. The Pacific people can survive because we had a traditional system that existed for thousands of years. That's my main message that I wanted to share at this time. Thank you. Dr. Rosia. Um, I just like to reiterate that, you know, more than ever, this is the time that we must demand climate justice to recolonize the mindset of the Pacific people, to relearn and practice traditional knowledge, wisdom, and skills so they can appreciate and take it to heart. Traditional knowledge is the mother of all knowledge, the first knowledge that children learn to ensure their survival before they enter school. It must continue to be nurtured and practiced in schools and in the communities. Ladies and gentlemen, let's replicate the projects in Tuvalu by documenting, digi sorry, digitizing and weaving our knowledge into our school curriculum. Declaring the indigenous rights alone is not enough. We need to have the political will to put this knowledge into practice so they are valued and passed on for a sustainable and resilient world for our children. As COVID-19 takes over the world, so must we recolonize our thinking and approach with our traditional philosophies and epistemologies. Thank you. Thank you. So that brings us to the end of uh, all speakers and the lessons that they would like to share from that books. Um, you know, this session was about traditional wisdom and practice in session to informing resilience thinking and actions in the Pacific. Our speakers have covered a broad yet important range of topics from funerary protected areas in Fiji to Tuvalu and traditional ecological knowledge on weather indicators in Tuvalu. And then we had COVID-19 COVID impacts on recovery uh, by Perry and also uh, what women fisheries are going through uh, in Papua New Guinea. We hope uh, as organizers for this session that you have uh, learned as much from the speakers as we have ourselves from listening to each other. Uh, and we hope that you know, it'll, it'll help improve the work that you do, but also for the communities that you serve. And with that, we thank you for your time in joining us for our session. Um, if there's any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to the speakers. Uh, and finally, for those who didn't uh, watch the full video or would like to watch it again, I believe the link for that video is up online on our session platform. So please don't hesitate to uh, do that when you're ready. Again, thank you all from the session organizers. Uh,